So welcome to the Beyond the Surface TV CETO After Show. I got my buddy Bill Miller from down Tampa with me. We, uh, we had us a good time breaking down Caravel and its eastern directions. Uh, we, was, we was challenged by Mother Nature. She seems to challenge a lot these days. And she had come in there uh, and, and within 10 days of our uh, arrival, uh, she had uh, brought in eastern winds with a ton of cool air. It blew, 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 had three cold fronts in 10 days prior to us showing up. And all of that deep water became weird up there. Um, so uh, so what we want to do is we just kind of want to recollect a little bit of how, how, how we did and, uh, and what, we, what changes we had to make to be successful so that we could uh, we could leave Carabell feeling good about ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I know you remember, um, you know, uh, we, we tried some deep water stuff, some stuff adjacent to deep water there immediately out of the river. Um, that tend to be pretty tough. Uh, it, it seemed like uh, we needed to find some areas where the water was shallow longer. So they couldn't make that transition to the deep water. Uh, I know, you remember us, we tried a couple of the docks. We tried some sheephead stuff. Um, I guess they had moved out of that. Um, Dog Island's beautiful. That, uh, that was a sight to see. That was really pretty. All them houses in there is amazing. They're still there. Um, um, do you remember uh, when we shifted over towards, uh, we ran over there towards the east and we started getting some of that salt, salt marsh and stuff like that. Things really started to come together. And um, you were like a, you were like a machine once we got in there. You know, it was like, it was like we, me and you both was like, check that out. That looks familiar. That I can deal with. You know, I think we still have, we have a chance here. When you come to a new place like we did, um, it's hard number one. Mm -hmm. You're not used to that area. Uh, you add the factor of the wind in there, so your chances of probability and success are low. Mm -hmm. um, from being down here in the Tampa Bay area, I'm not used to looking at sawgrass. I'm used to looking at mangroves, oyster bars. You got a lot of oyster bars in Cedar Key. Uh, but we, when we got up there, it took us a minute of, of looking around and uh, maybe talking to a few people, asking a few questions, and then. But once we got honed in on the creeks and the sawgrass, yeah. it was uh, it was game on, and we, we caught some nice fish. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I, you know, you know, in in the fishing world, I don't care if you're in your hometown or out of town. Anytime Mother Nature comes in there, she changes it all, especially with that much weather change that fast. Uh, I mean, it was just relentless, one cool snap after the other. I would love to try to make it back over there another time, uh, right in there in, uh, in Carabelle and, and see if we couldn't, you know, make something click with it. We didn't have that huge temperature drop. I mean, it isn't, it isn't rocket science that if you got three to four feet of water here and 400 yards, 500 yards that way, you have 25 feet of water wide open. I mean, is they're going to move. They're going to dive off and, and disappear. And that's exactly what we found out here, you know, in this trip was uh, they haul butt, you know, and, and uh, we, you got a small window. You know, we, we had a small window to make it happen. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm blessed that we was able to make that move uh, and get in some familiar areas that, that made sense to us so that we could catch fish. Um, it looks when you when you come into a new area there's a couple things that, that i like to do when i come into a new area first i start do i know anybody up here in this area who can point me in the right direction are there some charts i could look at to to see maybe some areas that that might point me in the right direction and then once you get in that direction in that place you just have to let instinct take over yeah, you don't try to outthink it. You, yes. you just go in like you and I said, that looks good. Yes, sir. And if that looks good to you, then you're going to cast over there and just follow your instincts. And if you've been around and fished as much as you have and I have, then there's certain things we see that look successful uh, to us in the past. So yeah. that's right where we go, and and majority of the time it, it does work. Yes, sir. Yeah, you 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 hit it on the head there. You all you you can only do so much homework before you have to get your feet wet, so to speak, you know, the homework's only going to get you so far and it's time to get your feet wet. Yep. And, uh, yeah, we, we moved right in there, uh, you know, just recollecting, we, we pulled in there and we started diagnosing some of those creeks. And obviously the very first thing we noticed pretty quick, both of us were like, Whoa, whoa that's a dark spot that brings, that brings warmth mm -hmm. and they're going to be looking for warmth. 
and we know what they did over, you know, a little farther to the west. We knew they ran for deep water. So that was the deepest little pothole we could we seen already, you know, within a mile. So uh, that was obviously a pretty good guess. And, uh, you know, we, we plugged in there. We uh, I think uh, I think we kind of mixed it up, if I remember right. We throwed a, uh, a couple of jig heads a few times. We throwed some suspended lures a couple of times. The trout reacted to both of them. Uh, and so that was, a, that was the kickoff of the day. And, to, and, and, a, and a little confidence boost, if you will, for us to go, okay, we can do this. We, we got it. Because <laughs> at first we wasn't sure. <laughs> no, we, were, we, we, were struck, we were We were thinking, oh, boy, we're going to have to work today. But I, I tell you, if you, when you see a creek, like we got into these creeks, and there's an edge there with deep water. Yeah. An edge with deep water says, throw a bait over here. There's some fish that like be there. Yeah. And if you add in a point where that current can come around that point, either in front of that ripple where that point is, or more than likely in the back of that ripple, and whether it's in Carabelle or it's in Boca Grande or it's in Everglade City, that's gonna be a fish spot. Yes, sir. And you just have to keep throwing, and then then you see a pattern, and we were throwing in those places, but then all of a sudden, we look in front of us in the shallow, and there were those fish up in the shallow trying to get warm. Yeah. Danny spotted them right away. Yeah. Saw one threw right over that fish, ran over there and popped yeah. that bait. And then that's a pattern that we stayed with and we caught some good fish doing it. Sure did. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah, we, we plucked around in the holes there for a little while, you know, and, and it was consistent, you know, consistently slow. As I like to say, uh, you know, we would throw s seven, eight times and get bumped and then might throw the next time and get picked up. You know, but as the tide was flooding, you know, our brains went, okay, we can go deeper. Yeah. They got to be more deeper. So that's exactly what we did. We just bunched right on in there and kept that that, that deck cap brought us back there. Gush, it was shallow. It was shallow. Real shallow. Got back in there where the, the reds were V-waking, uh, maybe even a little tail here and there moving around, and then you know just letting us know, hey, yeah, you guys, you guys picked the right area. We're here. <laughs> well, when we saw those fish, and it was sight fishing. It was 50% of it was throwing the fish that we could see. You were up on the bow and you made those fish bite. How did you, when you saw that fish moving or sitting there, where did you throw your bait to try to get it in that fish that strikes up? You know, I, I try to teach people on the boat with my, my regular life uh, with, with work. I try to teach them to take the pressure off uh, for two reasons. You know, if, you, if, you, if your mind is in such a boggled state of mind that I have to hit that fish in the head, first off, you're gonna spook him. We all know that, especially under those conditions where they're cold. But the other, uh, the biggest part of it is if you will throw on past him, you know, but lead him and make something natural. Uh, a lot of people try to throw out in front of him. Uh, and I'm a big fan of throwing way on past him, let that noise happen, and then silently drag it up there and make it look as natural as possible. And then, of course, there's always luck. <laughs> There's always luck. And, and he had most of it <laughs> while we were up there. <laughs> I mean, that, I tell people that all the time. I've seen people on the bow, and I've got them set up the exact same way, and I know you have as well over your years. And I've seen right there the woman whip the man and the man whip the women and just catch them, and the other one's going, Danny, what am I doing wrong? And I'm going, you didn't bring the right luck with you today. Yeah. Like, Y'all are using every, the exact same technique. Um, and um, But to answer your question, yeah, that, I, think, I think the approach, the way you bring the bait into that fish when he's sensitive, you know, we were watching him move around on us like crazy. Um, and then again, I think if you keep bugging him sometimes, I think if you just keep showing him something, showing him, I think you might even, and this is me getting in a fish's head, and you might even be adding a little confidence to them that that's normal. I've done seen that thing six times in the past however long. It could be just showing them, bringing some normalcy to them that they... And I know we know they're hungry. I, I agree with that. There's a, the baits, you want the base to look like something natural. Yeah. A shrimp tail in this little area. We knew there's a lot of shrimp around, things like that. Yeah. And so you can throw something in there that's an imitator. Yeah. And, and thinking the redfish will say, well, this is a crab, this is a shrimp, a white bait, whatever the case might be. Yeah. And, but then after a while, they're, they're not, they're not grooving on that. They don't want any part of that. And, but if you keep throwing them back and forth again, then it becomes an aggravator. That's right. And I think after, like like you said, Danny, when that bait comes by them five or six times, they just say, enough of that. I'm going to reach out there and pop that thing and get it away from me. And, yeah. 
the imitator and the aggravator are two of the theories that make our fish strike artificial baits. Yeah. Always go with the imitator first, yeah. like we were <laughs> doing. Right. But then the hatch. sometimes yeah. you got to just throw it right in there, hit them on the head, yeah, and they'll turn out. and bite that yeah. thing because they're aggravated. They yeah. want to get the heck out of there. I don't like to admit this. I don't like to admit this at all because I got a few bass guys that, uh, you know, the bass guys a lot of times and the redfish guys a lot of times, they bump heads a little bit mm -hmm. of their theories. But I got to admit, I learned that thought process from my bass guys catching bad, bad, bad and fish, you know, yeah. bugging them, bugging them, bugging yeah. them. And, and I usually, I, I don't, go full on bugging them, you know, but, but I like to splash it a little bit, you know, a little bugging and, and, you know, bring it right in there by them and just keep going, keep going and keep going. And like I say, you just hope we fish off of hopes, you know what I mean? So you just hope that they'll finally cave and have to have it. There's a, and, and they did. And there's another thing that we did too. When you, we talk about that imitator, the first bait that I'm going to use is a, a bait that imitates the color of what we think the bait fish is there. You know, the yeah. shrimp was kind of a copper and, maybe a, a whiter, a, a lighter color. But then after a while, if they're not biting that, go to the brightest, yeah. bright orange with racing stripes on it and throw that in there and that's the aggravator color. Yeah, It's the technique and also the color goes from imitator to aggravator. And you'll find, hopefully, yeah. somewhere in your tackle box, you'll find something that works. In another theory too, I call it the wild card. You know, uh, when you get out there and you're just racking and racking and racking and nothing's working. You know, next thing I do, I go, okay, everything I think will work, but it's not. Yeah. So what won't work? What will absolutely not work? What will I throw in the water and every fish in the scene go, what the heck, and run, yeah. Yeah. okay? So then I go and I grab that, and I start working that with the same thought process, and a lot of times that happens. You, and you scratch your head every time. You're like, why would you eat this over what we were showing you that matches the hatch? Yeah. It, it holds true a lot of times, but not every time. Yeah. I, I would say... Give your favorite bait or the bait that you think is going to work. Give it some time. Yeah. Don't yeah. be but don't be stubborn. Be patient, but don't be stubborn. And if it's not working, try something else. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Remember when we went we, when the tide really started pushing good, and we we left that one larger size pond where we caught I think we caught two or three, maybe four. I don't remember. We spooked a bunch in there. And then the tide, you know, we noticed that we, we quit seeing V-weights. So we knew we'd gotten a good 10 and 12 inches possibly. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, let's go deeper. So we took right on out there in the back and went deeper. And we, we got right in this almost, you know, I, it almost reminded me of like a thermos. Like you would check your temperature, like a thermostat. Mm -hmm. It was a long tube, like, like a trench, so to speak. And then it had a big bubble in the back. I remember that. Settlement, like in the back. Mm -hmm. And there was nowhere oh, yeah, for them. I remember that exactly. There was nowhere for them fish to go. They were back there and we couldn't, because it was so confined, even though we were in that big boat and we were being really careful, it was so confined back there, you literally couldn't let a bait hit the water because it, it was an alarm went off in their heads. And uh, going back to what we were talking about a minute ago, I was sit we were sitting there going, throwing, you know, everything that just worked five minutes ago mm -hmm. was now no longer working. And uh, I remember going, wild card. What, what's the stupidest thing? What's the stupidest thing possible to throw in there? And it was the bulkiest bait we had tied up. But the key, I think, to that whole deal was I was able to get past them and bring it to them, not quite so crazy, but still crazy compared to what we caught the other fish on. Lo and behold, that didn't work for a fish. It was only one, but it, but it did work. And that's what I, I, that's where that wild card sometimes flip your brain, flip the script, so to speak, and go to what you think there's no way in heck they might bite. <laughs> you, you said this twice, and it, it's the truth, that when, especially in shallow water, when you see these fish, the splash of the lure or the bait, if you do that right in front of them, most of the time they're gonna run. Most of the time. Every now and then they might turn around just out of instinct and make a strike at it, but you need to throw it past them mm -hmm. and reel it up to them. Yeah, yeah. And give, it, give yourself plenty of room, and if there's tide, you know, play for the tide moving. Yeah. But you can, you can reel that bait up there, and you can see it coming all of a sudden, and you'll see that fish the body language changes. Uh -huh. The fins may go out almost like he humps up uh -huh. and, and he, okay, he sees it, he <laughs> yeah, sees it. it. Now you don't want it to come, I don't like to have it come over their shoulder, uh -huh. but when you get it out there, you know, this far in front of them, uh, that's pretty exciting too, especially when you watch it. Yeah, the, you, you, you made a great point there. A lot of folks make that mistake and I'll tell you what they don't think about. They want to run that thing uh, whether it's left or right side of the fish, obviously over and other side is going to be the worst. They forget the line. Mm -hmm. you know? They forget what that line does to that water. And, and that fish is already on the fence already. He's already on the guard going, what's around me? Something's different. I don't know what it is, but something's different. And you lay a chunk of 
fluorocarbon or braid, whatever it might be, across the top, that's going to be just enough. You know, like you said, once a blue moon, somebody's going to get crazy and turn around and completely blow your mind. Um, but definitely, uh, I think lead them past them, make it as absolutely natural as possible, and you're already against the odds anyway. Yeah, it was uh, and we tried to go out and do the sheep head thing. Um, we had a little small technical technical difficulties with the depth finder. Uh, we had just got the depth cat. We just got it in the water. We had like two days into learning it, um, so we didn't get to do our our uh, reef stuff that we planned on. We planned on trying to do a trout. We planned on we tr we planned on trying to break the area down completely with with the time you know in March it was you know with the cold air we still had the sheep head around, but that didn't that didn't work out for us. Uh, but we did. Uh, See all those big trout in the creek. Gosh almighty, yeah, that there was one some creek. Big trout in there. That was unbelievable. And it, it was almost like Jurassic Park, like somebody just pulled in there with like a helicopter and, and a big dump and just, just dumped a whole bunch of big mama trout in there. They look like redfish <laughs> to me because I'm not used to seeing trout that big. Yeah. And they look like redfish. And we use the same technique for the same casting. And, but, you know, sometimes you'll spook the fish, and they'll spook for whatever reason. And I saw you do this, um, and you say, oh, they're gone. Well, they may be gone, but you know what? You can still throw a just throw a cast out there in front of them. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, and you did this one time. He made Danny made this cast, and there's no way. And all of a sudden, the fish turned and bit it. And uh, so, if you can see them and get a cast in their cast, and you know, don't, don't outthink the thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I tell you, you know, going forward, uh, if we had some more days uh, over in the area uh, to 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 come back towards Carabella a little bit more and, and and work over there. I think those beaches over there, uh, a lot of the locals were giving us some hints and and some ideas that uh, actually one one fellow said two weeks ago we was catching the big redfish all over this yeah. grassy area that was on that was growing off of the beach off of Dog Island there and then uh, back on the mainland as well. But that was before all the 15 degree water temperature drop. When I mentioned that, he I said he's all excited and I said well it it, it at 15 degree water drop, and he went, oh yeah, them fish are probably gone. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, if we had another couple of days, which we didn't, but if we was to ever get back over there, I think that Dog Island uh, beach area would be a cool area to kind of learn more of and diagnose a little bit. And yeah, it was so beautiful, man. I mean, it's hard to fish because you're just kind of just watching, just seeing all the scenery. It's hard to stay focused on fish. I think if I was going up there the first time, not knowing, I would have gone right there yeah. because that looks like something I'm familiar with. Yeah, for real. Fishing along the beaches and grass and yes, off like that. Especially you, yeah. There's a, a another thing that I've, I've gotten wind of and I've heard about through the years. We just didn't have time to do That's tarpon. Yeah. And we talked to one of my buddies up there, Harry, Captain Harry Spear, and he said, yeah, there's tarpon, yeah. plenty of tarpon, but the weather's got to be right. Right. And that uh, years ago, I remember buddies of mine talking about Indian Pass, which is just up a little further toward exactly. Apalachicola. Yeah. Yep. It's supposed to be tons of tarpon and sharks and things like that in the past feeding yeah. on the pogies or the shad or the a little later the, yeah. the razor bellies but i don't think the time of the year was quite right for that but we were a little early yeah. it was a carabella is a fishy area yeah i'd and, like to go uh, back i'd like to take beyond the surface back over there again maybe next year and uh pick a warmer month and maybe get away from those those cold front problems but yeah i mean i think uh you know in a, in a nutshell the uh, the seto after show uh, is meant to for us to, you know, when you're out there on the boat and you're trying to crack the code, so to speak, and you're trying to get the fish to cooperate, this this after show gives us a chance to calm down and settle, Talk about and, and and think, you know, and think a little things. bit more, and actually be able to get verbally verbal with people, you know, and uh, and and try to, if you ever have a chance to go to Carabelle, see the area and fish, hopefully some of the stuff we showed you guys on the water and uh, some of the stuff that we talked about, um, hopefully that helps you, you know, that's what that's what the goal is, is try to help a little bit where we can, and. Um, and yeah, pick some. Don't go when there's three cold fronts in ten days. That's a that's a bad time to go. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed uh, me and Bill with the uh, Cito after show, and uh, you guys have a great day.